So we're starting the health and safety in health and social care unit today. Now, we're going to be looking at learning outcome one, which is understand the current legislative framework for health and safety. So we're going to look at two criteria. 1.1 is explain the legislative framework for health and safety in a health and social care work setting. And 1.2 is, is explain employer and employee rule, oh, can't speak to her, roles and responsibilities for health and safety in a setting as defined by the legislation. So we're going to cover those two points. And it's not a long one, to be honest. Uh, um, there's not many criteria, so we get through it quite quickly on here. Let's change this into a bigger... There you go. Will this one be a power PowerPoint as well as a... Uh, I think this one is just a, a Word uh, a document, but I'll have a look. I'm pretty sure I had a, a little look earlier, and uh, I'm... 99% sure that it's just a Word document, but I'll have a look just to make sure at the end of this. No worries. Thank you. So the aim of the unit for today is just to help you to understand the health and safety responsibilities for any roles that you have and what sort of safeguarding roles and uh, responsibilities you've got towards staff and service users. So just a bit of an introduction when we get into health and safety. We know that health and safety is a big thing for everyone, wherever you're working. And it is a, a very big part of how you work and what sort of systems you use throughout the day. So it's, it's an essential consideration for all practitioners within healthcare. And this unit itself is going to help you to, you know, develop an understanding of why it's so important that health and safety is monitored and why it's implemented and why we look at these legislations and policies and what they're actually there for. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. You know, like the health and safety, like the policies and stuff like that, because when you look at health and safety, a lot of it's just common sense. But yeah. do, 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 do you believe that the health and safety, like the legislations have been put there for, actually, for our safety? Do you think like it went, whoever put them there was based on the fact that they were looking out for us or the fact that they were going to lose money if they got sued? I think mainly that my own personal thoughts on it, I've not really thought about it much, but from the top of my head, I believe that the health and safety policies are there just to avoid it. Because if you do get injured at work, it's going to cost your employees, isn't it? So the general concept is there, so you're not... It's, there partly for your safety but also again so that the work um, environment isn't liable so that you know because if you're told you can do a b and c and you decide to do something else then wherever you're working is going to say we gave you the proper procedures you were we're not liable for whatever injuries happened because you've done this out of your own error so yeah in a way i do sort of agree with you but then again it's, it's put there just to give people the basic common sense just say right you can do this and you can't do that and there are a lot of people that will understand it without even having to be told, but then there are some people that may just need a bit of a push and a, a gentle reminder that you can do this and you can't do that. So, yeah, I do agree with what you're saying as well. So I, I do think it is sort of like a money-saving thing as well. So, yeah. When we get into the basic health and safety concepts on here, we're going to look at some hazards and risks. Now, you're probably... Um, seen a lot of this as well so things that, that you know will cause a harm or a risk is something that there's a chance of um something happening where somebody will get harmed so you know things like if you've got a knife um, laying around it's not in the kitchen it's been put on a counter on a table outside in the dining area somebody might harm themselves by getting cut you've got substances where if there's bleach that has been left open and there's a young child around, they might think it's a bottle of water or something and drink it. So there's a lot of issues that can happen, like if there's a wet floor and you've not put the wet floor signs down, somebody slips and falls, they can get hurt, which is so there's a lot of hazards and risks about in, in a generalised way as well. Where is my, there you go. And then how do we actually minimise risk? So when we're identifying what hazards there are, we're actually 
carrying out risk assessment. So we're, we're going around, we've probably got a, a little clipboard in the hands and we're ticking off bits and bobs or making notes. So risk assessment, we're just making sure that we're evaluating all the risks. We're taking note of any hazard, like say a loose tile or the carpet is frayed in one place or there's a leaking tap or there's a, a broken um, wardrobe or cupboard. So any of these things, we're making a note of them and we're seeing what the risk is and we're putting into place to make sure that no one gets harmed. So you've got responsibility and liability. So as an employer and an employee, you've both got responsibility and you've both got reliability. Liability, sorry. So responsibility as in if you see something that's there, you make sure that it's noted so it can get uh, taken care of. And also to make sure that you're following these rules and uh, these uh, policies and procedures so you're not putting yourself at harm anyway. And liability, again, is if you're not following those in a way, then you're going to be liable. So going on to 1.1, we're going to explain the legislative framework for health and safety in a health and social care setting. So we've got a couple of uh, current health and safety legislations over here. We've got a Health and Safety at Work Act, got the Food Safety Act, Food Safety Regulations, Manual Handling Operations, RIDOR, so this is a long one, Reporting of Injuries, Diseases, and dangerous occurrences regulations. And then COSH is control of substances hazardous mm -hmm. to health. Yes. And we're going to go through a few of these. Some guy come in, you know, some guy come in the rehab about two, about two and a half, three weeks ago it was. Uh -huh. And he actually done health and safety with us. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> so I'm, I'm quite, uh, it's still fresh in my mind. <laughs> but yeah, that's no, what I've done, good. RIDOR and the COSH. Well, that's really good then, because you'll have a bit of a background with it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, my laptop's been really uh, bugging me lately. It's just slowed up. There you go, it's working now. So then we've got us a few other legislations, like Health and Social Care Act, which is 2008, the Care Standards Act, Mental Health Act, Disability and Equality Act, Children's Act, and the Child Care Act. So these will also come within health and safety. So when we're looking at systems, policies and procedures, we need to look at what your health and safety management systems and your standards are, what sort of policies are, how you actually apply them to the workplace, you know, what are your procedures. You'll, you'll probably notice uh, in the centre you're at, right, you might have um, uh, little posters uh, around the place, especially if there's manual manual handling going on where it says bend at the knees, you know, uh, don't bend your back, keep it straight, and it tells you exactly what you should and shouldn't be doing to try and lift heavy things. So even simple things as having posters or leaflets or being a um, a role model and actually doing certain things, that is how you can implement them as well. Giving uh, responsibility to people, giving them training, making sure that you're following the legislations and the guidelines, Keeping records, so you might have noticed that there's like accident forms if anybody's cut themselves or uh, bumps into um, uh, something or uh, into a door or anything, there'll be an accident form that can be uh, filled out. And then you can also audit, review and monitor your system. So you're reviewing them regularly, you're making sure that they're being monitored to see that. Is this reflecting where we are? Does it reflect our centre? Does it work for us? Do we need to change something? And then you've got the Care Quality Commission. So the CQC, you've heard of them already. We talked about them a few times. They're a non-departmental public body of the Department of Health. And uh, they're established in 2009. And they're just there to regulate and inspect health and social care services in England. So if they come in and they see things that they're not happy with, they can put you to action points and say, these are the few actions that we need you to fix for our next visit. And if they come back the next time and they've not been done, they can put you down again. They can, they can go from step by step in more seriousness. And ultimately, they can close the centre down if they feel that is um, a hazard and they're not following uh, the legislations and the regulations. 
Then you've got Kosh, like you've already done a few weeks ago. So this is um, a part of um, a, a general requirement is being imposed on employers to protect employees and anybody else that comes into their vicinity from any hazards um, at risk, especially from substances. So they carry out risk assessment, they check the control of exposure, they look at the health surveillance, they look at incident planning. So in on a basic level, the way that a lot of centres do this is if you've got access to cleaning equipment or if you've got access to certain medical equipment that is um, like chemicals, then you need to make sure that they're locked away so far. A basic level, if you've got cleaning equipment, bleach, sprays, window cleaners, mops, anything like that, they have to be put away into a locked cupboard that only the people that have the only certain people who have access to, so that nobody else can come along, open the cupboard and um, look at the um, the substances and think that oh okay what is this because you get a lot of young people you get a lot of vulnerable people who might not understand what they're doing so it's important that these steps are taken. Then you've got the Food Safety Act of 1990, and this is a statutory obligation to treat food that is intended for human consumption in a controlled and managed way. They've got key requirements, and it says that the food has to comply with the food safety requirements, and it must be of the nature, substance, and quality demanded, and that it needs to be correctly labelled. So in a basic way that if there's something that needs to be refrigerated, they need to make sure that it is refrigerated. That if you've opened, a, a, say, a tin of beans and you've not used it all, don't just put that tin back into the fridge. Pop it into a plastic container and then put it into the fridge because then you're um, stopping any, um, oh, what do they call it, where a contamination from the actual tin, any chemicals leaking into it. So there's like simple things that have to be followed. Like for example, you've been working in the kitchen lately, haven't you, Lee? Yes. Yeah, and there's certain things there that you're allowed to do, aren't you? You might have people that are vegetarian, you might have people that are meat eaters, but you'll have like, um, I remember when I was uh, a lot younger, I used to work in a cafe, and uh, from there we used to have colour-coded uh, like uh, equipment, like... Cloths, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And mops so, and cloths. Exactly, and even uh, when we were serving the food, we had... Uh, colour-coded spatulas where I think it was um, green for vegetarian, red for uh, bacon, black for chicken, something like that. So we knew exactly which one to pick up for what food we were getting. That's how it should be though because then everything's in order. So in the rehab you'd like for not just the kitchen but anywhere, like for the toilet and stuff you have like red cloths, red mops, for the sink yeah. you have blue cloths, for the showers you have orange cloth for the prayer room it's a purple cloth you know what i mean so each each area of the building has a pacific color cloth that gets used and a pacific colored coded mop so you know it's not nothing gets like transmitted say like you're not using the same yeah. mop in the toilet than you would in the prayer room it, exactly so you're not contaminating your areas i remember when i was in uh, primary schools we used to have especially within the the years that i worked in i did reception and year one so they were like ages uh four five and six and sometimes they'd wet themselves sometimes they'd get dirty themselves and there were certain equipment that i had to learn which one we could use and which one we couldn't because there were some for general areas and there were some for uh, soiling so yeah it's fantastic when they're colour coded. So you can just quickly go in, get your job done, and then you're done. Yes, yes. Then we've got personal protective equipment at work regulations ninety two. So this um, is created under the Health and Safety at Work Act. So it came uh, into force in Great Britain in uh, January nineteen ninety three. And uh, this particular um, legislation, this regulation, it places a duty on every employer to make sure that they've got proper equipment. So if you're in a building site, they need to supply you with a hard hat, a yellow vis, a high vis jacket, with boots, in a hospital, masks, uh, surgical gloves, uh, protective aprons, you know, all of these things. If you're in a, uh, um, in a restaurant, 
you need to make sure that you've got a hair covering, so either a cap or a hair net, and that you're wearing gloves when you're handling food. So under this, it needs to be making sure that you've got all this. And again, if you're working with food, you, you don't use the, the brown coloured pastas or the skin coloured pastas. You've got to make sure you use a blue one. So if it falls in food, it's quite identifiable. So there's things, regulations that have been set for each industry. And then the last section on here, so the RIDO, so reporting on injuries, diseases and dangerous occurrences. So this is 2013. And this regulation just helps employees and everybody else that is in control of a workplace to how to keep a record or how to report certain things. So if there's certain things that happen whilst you're in the work environment, they will get reported to RIDO. So it won't be something like, oh, somebody fell down um, while they were in, uh, in a outdoor area and scrape their knee it'll be some things that like quite serious so if there's any work-related accidents where a death has happened any accidents where a serious injury has happened so I remember I used to work in a, um, a photography shop and uh, one of our managers went to close the shutters at the end of the day there were internal shutters and um, he half stood under the shutters when he should have been standing a little bit further back. I think he got distracted. He twisted the key for the shutters. They must have rung function and just went straight slamming into his back and he got really badly hurt. And he had to, he had a very bad uh, back injury. He got back into work a couple of years later, but he had to walk with a walking stick after that. So that type of injury at that time would have been reported to the door. If there's any uh, certain uh, occupational diseases that have been happened, or if there's any dangerous occurrences where a potential harm or gas-related incident has happened, all of these things get reported to RIDO. So is this section okay, Lee? Do you want to um, discuss anything? Yeah, uh, the, the, very well. Um, it is basically got everything in it that, that, that yeah. you need for that actual question. Yeah. Um, but I was I was thinking like what I was saying before, but when it comes to health and safety, like how many employers out there have actually put or implemented or done that? I know, I know it's law and stuff like that, but you know, how many of us are doing it because you actually care about the employers, or mm. is it because they're doing it to cover their own backs, or maybe both? I don't know. Um, I think it's human nature. When if we can cut corners, we will cut corners. If we can get away with something we will do it. I think that's just what human nature is for us. So if these things were not in place, I'm pretty sure that there'll be like a very high percentage of companies and uh, places that will probably not follow these regulations. And there'll probably be a small percentage that do. But because it's been made into the law, they've got no other choice. If they don't follow them, they're going to get um, uh, uh, fined and they might get shut down. So they have to do it. But again, it is... As, and naturally, we always find easy things and ways to get out of uh, responsibilities or cut corners. So, yeah, in a way, what you're saying is correct, that it is a big question as if, if this was an, a legislation, would it still be you? Um, well, I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I don't know who heard it off, but I heard it uh, not long ago. And this, this well, a group went into, like, a restaurant and one of the the... Someone in that group ended up like falling on the floor. Um, something happened, but uh -huh. because the first aider wasn't there, the the the, the other the, the the other staff members that were actually in the restaurant they couldn't deal with that person because. Yeah. But but it, it, even though it could have been only you know something as simple as lifting the head up or something like that, and it's stuff like that, it probably gets on me with that because if you know that you you know. You, you can help somebody. You, you might not have to go, or you might, through, through law, you might mm -hmm. not be, you, you might just be sat on the next table, but through law, like, you, you can't help that person because just in case that person gets more injured. But if you know what you're doing and you're, you can save that person's life, I don't care what anyone says. I'd, I'd take the rap. I'd go to prison for it. I'd help that person. Yeah, 
No, but if you've got the, the correct first aid training and you know that you can help them, yeah, definitely go ahead. You, know, I, I've done first aid training uh, throughout my career, and there's uh, certain things that you are like. You like, I was told by my first aid trainer that if I, for example, went to Trafford Centre and I saw a young man uh, fall down who can't breathe, now I don't have to gain that person's permission to help them. If they've got a family member, I can ask them. But ultimately, if they're unconscious and they can't uh, give me permission, then I can go ahead and help them. But if they're conscious, I've got to say, ask them, you know, can, I've got this experience, can I help you? Then they can give me consent. But um, So there are a lot of things that you can do. But, yeah, I mean, in that aspect, they should have had more than, they should have one first aid trainer on each shift. That would have been a, a better thing for them to do, to have more uh, stress trained in it so that somebody else can actually help. Yeah, it's just weird, like, the, the, the staff didn't help because they weren't trained, and the, the, the trainer that could, could have done wasn't there, so the other staff didn't do anything. It's like, wow. You well, know. they should have gone up to the person and, and checked if he was okay, or even That's called I mean, the ambulance yeah. and, or asked, you know, or even asked around uh, the other restaurants here, the guests, is there a first aid trainer, is somebody from a medical profession here? So there's a lot of things that they could physically have done without even touching the person themselves, but... It just depends on how much hassle you want to take on. Uh, I guess it comes down to that. Yeah, yeah. So on to 1.2. So we're looking at explaining the employer and employee roles and responsibilities for health and safety in a setting as defined by legislation. So who actually has responsibility for health and safety in any setting? So in accordance to any legislation that you look at, employers, employees, any appointed officers, any individuals, any carers, or anybody that has access to any service users or any provision actually has a responsibility. Now, if I was to come into your um, centre now and I was to come in and say, right, I'm coming in to train you right here. I'm going to do a face-to-face -face lesson with you, Lee. I'd still have a responsibility towards health and safety. I can't just go and put, chuck my handbag where someone can trip up or start um, you know, like the kids do where they lean back in the chair and they're lifting the legs up. You still got a responsibility towards yourself and towards others while you're there, even though you're there just as a visit. So ultimately, everybody has responsibility. And then what are the responsibilities? So for an employer, they've got to train their staff, give them the correct safety equipment, make sure that their staff are actually being compliant, that they're following the, the requirements within that and then for employees to make sure that they follow the procedures they're working safely and that they're reporting any issues that might come up and then an employee's duty of care within practice is to make sure that the workplace is safe prevent risks to health so make sure that all the equipment has been locked away that there's nothing that is accessible that you can't get hold of, if you've got a service user, you can't get hold of any medication that might not be theirs or put cleaning substances away. Ensure that there's safe working practices. So make sure that if you're doing, uh, you're manually handling patients, if you have to physically lift them or you're giving them personal care and you're turning them and moving them around if they're not able to do themselves, that you've actually got the right procedures on how to roll a person or how to lift them slightly so you're not hurting yourself or that person as well and then again provide adequate first aid facilities so you know make sure that there's first aid boxes make sure there's accident report forms make sure that your staff are trained in first aid as well they've got to also make sure that all materials substances and equipment are handled and stored safely and that they're also used safely. So if I've uh, I've decided to mop the floor, there's been an accident, I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to mop the floor now. I could mop it and then I could just leave the floor soaking wet and I could just walk away. That wouldn't be responsible. I I, I could say, well, I, I, didn't, I don't know what to do. I mean, that's how I do it at home. You know, I don't put any hazard signs down. But then if I've got the proper training and saying, if you do certain tasks, make sure that you put the yellow uh, uh, sign out saying wet floor and so on. So you've got to make sure that your staff is trained correctly. Because the things we do at home and the things we do at work will be completely different. 
So tell you about any potential hazards. So if I come in and uh, you're my manager, Lee, and you'll be right after there's a loose tile and there's a leaky tap in that bathroom. So just be careful around those areas. Make sure you don't slip. Make sure, let me know if that tile is falling down. So let me know all those hazards. Set up an emergency plan. So you probably would have them um, around your centre. You'll probably have done fire drills or you'll probably know which areas like to go in if there's ever an issue or, you know, you probably have certain plans that have been shown to you, but there'll be things that might not have been shown as well. They'll have plans in place. And then again, make sure that there's ventilation. So if you're in a, a, a room that's not got a window, they need to make sure there's vents in there. Good temperature, good lighting, there's toilet, there's washing facilities, you can go and rest somewhere. So that all of these things will meet your health and safety requirements, but also your welfare requirements as well, to make sure that you feel comfortable and relaxed. So that's the employer um, responsibilities. And then you also got to make sure that you've got the right equipment and that it's being supplied that you've got the right things that you need and that it actually works as well. So if you're giving gloves and masks, make sure they're not ripped or they're not flimsy. If you've got um, certain electrical equipment that you're handing out, say someone's using iPads or phones or walkie-talkies, make sure that they're charged and they're actually working. Provide protective clothing or equipment. Make sure there's warning signs so everybody's got access to them and that they can put them out if needed. And also that there's... Um, like you'll see in certain hospitals, which will say no entry beyond this point or stop or no smoking uh, or no mobile phones, that type of thing. And then an employer has to report any accidents, injuries, diseases or any dangerous occurrences like RIDOR to the local authority or to RIDOR, depending on what it is. So that was the employee responsibilities. Now we're coming on to the um, employer, sorry, now we're coming on to the employee's responsibilities. So as an employee, you've got to make sure you take care of your own health and safety. Make sure you don't threaten others, but then you also see that if somebody else is being affected by an issue at work or by affected by your own work, then you try and not do that. Cooperate with your employer and make sure you go to training sessions and actually follow the procedures or the rules that they've set in place. Don't misuse any health and safety equipment. So uh, make sure you use it in a proper way, the way that it's actually meant to be done. And then also report any injuries or illness in the workplace. So overall, an employee has the duty of care to other people when they're carrying out their duties. They always need to make sure that they work in a safe manner and especially within the way that they've been trained and also follow the rules and uh, procedures that have been set in place. And then an employer must take, so and that's for, oh, I've got a spelling mistake, then let me fix that. Employer, there you go, sounds better, doesn't it? So an employer <laughs> was all the first part. And then the employee needs to take responsible care of their own health and safety and then not to put yourself at risk or to not to put anybody else at risk. So an employer shouldn't be requesting a staff member. So if you, you're an employer and you know that I, I've i never, say, put in an IV drip on someone or I've never given somebody personal care or I've never helped uh, escort somebody from one place to the other that may not be as mobile. You shouldn't be asking me to do those things unless you train me to do them. Then an employee who is given a work activity, so if you come up to me and you're my manager, Lee, and you've said to me, actually, I need to do this and this and this, I shouldn't actually go out and do it unless I've got the proper knowledge or training or experience to do that work. I should come up and say, actually, Lee, I don't know how to do these things. Maybe somebody else would be better suited, or I can do this, this, but can you assist me with that? So you also need to make sure that um, employees are supervised for a period of time. So an employer needs to make sure that they supervise their employees for a certain amount of time until they can see that, oh, okay, uh, Ash is good at this task now, she can do it. 
So you would come out and supervise me, make sure that I knew how to put in it your IV, and if I get stuck, then you'll be able to help me. And then if a person is requested to carry out a work activity and they don't feel confident in it and they don't feel competent in it, they need to tell their manager and say that I don't really feel I can do this task because I might be putting someone at harm and I don't want to go and, you know, use someone as a guinea pig, in other words. So please give me training or let me shadow someone until I know exactly how to do it. So in other words, if you don't know how to do something and someone asks you to do it, then just point it out and say, I'm not 100% sure I need a bit of training in this or a little bit of help in this. Uh, once I'm comfortable, I'll be able to do it on my own. So overall, we looked at some legislation for health and safety, and then we looked at what the employee's responsibilities are and what the employee responsibilities are and what their roles are in health and safety. Yep. Come out of this.